Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's carry on, uh, everyone. So we'll. Uh, so we have this dog, and uh, so then eventually you understand. Yeah. Eventually, one day, kind of the penny drops. Uh, not penny, the ringy drops. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the, uh, then you understand you have to go in a different direction, yeah. And then it's uh, you're on the right track. This is the idea here. And so what happens then? Well, this you know, of course you can never find satisfaction because of that uh, uh, bone. Yeah, it is only has a smeared in blood, uh, and that dog will eventually get weary and frustrated. And this is what this search in five sense world ends up. You just get tired after a while. You get frustrated. Uh, and you never find the satisfaction that you're looking for here. Yeah, in the same way, a noble disciple reflects with a simile of the skeleton. The Buddha said that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress. They are all the more full of drawbacks. And then comes the result of this. So what This is the result. This is kind of interesting when this happens. Having truly seen this with right understanding, yeah, so this is kind of the idea. You see this with right understanding. How do you see this with right understanding? Uh, well, first of all, you have confidence and faith in these things. Uh, and then you enter a deep state of samadhi where you actually abandon these things. Uh, and then from the vantage point of samadhi, when you're standing on the mountaintop, this is the idea of the samadhi, looking down, uh, then you understand what the five sense world is like because you have emerged from it. Uh, and that's when you see things with right understanding at that point. Uh, and then when you see things with the right understanding, uh, you reject the equanimity based on diversity and develop only equanimity based on unity. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you know what it means? Uh, maybe, uh, maybe not. Uh, it's testing your knowledge here, uh, testing your knowledge base. What does this mean? What is equanimity based on diversity? What is that? Uh? An equanimity based on diversity is basically the idea of sense restraint, right? Uh, when you go around in the world and you don't allow your senses to be pulled in all directions, uh, either because you reject things or because you desire things, uh, but your mind is kind of even. Uh, and that evenness of the mind is something that we're trying to achieve on the Buddhist path, because the evenness of the mind means that you have more clarity, uh, you have more mindfulness. Uh, the mind that is always pulled around by craving and desire is it's very difficult to be mindful because of the desires that they all the time. This is the equanimity based on diversity. But because you understand the downside of the five senses world, you understand that that equanimity, which still is related to the five senses, is not really enough. So you want to go beyond that. This is the full result of understanding the downside of the five senses world. Yeah? Is that you achieve what you achieve? You achieve samadhi as a consequence. This is where meditation happens. Because the five sense world is the thing that blocks you from deep meditation. As long as you hold on to the five senses, it is impossible to achieve the deep meditation because that lies beyond the five senses. You have to let go of them temporarily at least. Then you can achieve the equanimity based on unity, which is basically the equanimity of the, the jhanas, yeah? especially the last jhanas, the third and the fourth jhana. This is what it refers to now. So it's, it's very profound, yeah, the idea of giving up the five sense world. You may not understand what it really means to give that up, uh, but it's very, it's very profound. And the reason why it is so profound is because it's almost everything we know is the five sense world. Uh, yeah? You wake up in the morning, uh, you have the five senses around you. Uh, all the way throughout the day, until you go to bed at night, uh, the five senses are always there. Uh, and when you go to sleep at night, uh, what do you dream about? Uh, five sense world. Uh, yeah, that's everything. Do you ever have dreams about uh, generosity and kindness and meditation? Uh, it's quite rare, right? We don't really dream about those things. Uh, we dream about the five sense world. It kind of goes on and on and on. Uh. And so because we are so immersed in the five sense world, uh, because the five sense world is almost everything we know, uh, it's very tricky to get out of that world because we are obviously, this world is very meaningful to us. It matters to us because it is everything we know. And so uh, uh, this is why this is such a radical idea of gradually 
extracting yourself stage by stage, extracting yourself from that world and one day going beyond. And when you go beyond, that is when samadhi is possible. That's when you get the equanimity based on unity here. And of course, this is uh, something extraordinary. Yeah? People don't really understand how extraordinary these things are. These are things completely beyond your normal experience. Uh, these are the things where, you know, Ajahn Brahm writes the books about bliss upon bliss upon bliss. Uh, this is the kind of thing that he's talking about. Uh, it's a different reality, far more profound, uh, far more meaningful, far more happy than you have ever, ever experienced before. Uh, and you start to think of the five sense world in a very, very different way once you have these kind of experiences. Uh. So you develop the equanimity based on unity where all kinds of grasping to worldly pleasures of the flesh, and as a translation, cease without anything left over. Yeah, you don't hold on to the world or the five senses anymore. All of that is completely let go of. And you actually, you have no interest anymore because you realize actually it is not interesting. Yeah, and this is the idea of overcoming that world. It doesn't mean that you feel a lot of negativity about it. It doesn't mean that you force kind of the mind to let go of these things. It is a natural consequence of the gradual letting go and seeing something far more interesting. That's what happens when we do this, this, these things in the right way. Yeah? So it's kind of, uh, it's very, uh, very powerful and interesting. Yeah? So that is the first simile for you, the simile of the uh, bone, the dog and the bone. Yeah? This is only the first simile. Six more coming, yeah? So are you ready for this? Uh, <laughs> yes, you're very brave. You are <laughs> ready for all these things. Okay, so many of you will know what's coming, but some of you will not know what's coming. So for you, it's going to be very exciting to see what's happening next. Uh, <laughs> is it okay if we take the questions during the question period? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, yeah. So let's move on to simile B, exhibit B. <laughs> Suppose a vulture or a crow or a hawk was to grab a scrap of meat and fly away. Other vultures, crows and hawks would keep chasing it, pecking and clawing. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, crow or hawk doesn't quickly let go of that scrap of meat, wouldn't that result in death? or death-like suffering for them, for them, for it, maybe? Okay, whatever. Yeah, if you are a little bird, and you get hold of a piece of meat, and you fly off, and other birds see that you have a piece of meat, are those birds going to leave you alone? Are they going to say, yeah, yeah, you can have that meat? Of course not. Yeah, the world of birds is merciless. And there's massive competition, especially if you get a piece of meat. Okay, if you get a cockroach, maybe not so interesting, but a piece of meat, right? That's like, wow, the piece of meat. Very, very rare in the world of birds. Huh? And because the world of birds doesn't have many pieces of meat, if one bird gets a piece of meat, others are going to chase after. And they want to take and grab that piece of meat from you. Huh? Yeah, and this is kind of what is going on here. This is this idea of the piece of meat. Huh? So wouldn't that result in death or death-like suffering? Yes, sir. So uh, this is the uh, simile of the piece of meat. Yeah? And uh, what the Buddha is saying here is that the five sense world is a little bit like this. Uh, yeah? And so what it means is this idea that the five sense world, we're always competing over things. Uh, yeah, We always want the same thing. Did you get jealous when you saw this? Just new one because you got to be jealous because I <laughs> no. so the, so this is kind of just a small thing. I'm sure you didn't get jealous. I know you're just messing around, but uh, it was a nice. <laughs> yeah. So, but in general, we compete over things in the world. Yeah, the most obvious thing that we compete over are like uh, you know like. Uh, uh, partners in life, yeah, we compete over partners in life. People want the same partners, uh, and if one partner is popular, other people want it straight away simply because it's popular. So we want more of the same, yeah. So the same movie star, everyone likes the same movie stars, no matter how stupid those movie stars are, still kind of want those movie stars. Uh. <laughs> and so this is the world. So partners is one area where we want the same thing, yeah. We are competing over jobs in the job market. Uh. 
once we get the job, we're kind of competing internally in the company yeah, to kind of get the attention of the boss or whatever. Yeah. Everyone wants the same raise, right? Uh, we're competing over status. Who can have the highest status in our society? Yeah. As a child, you're maybe competing over toys, yeah, competing over food to eat. There's only so much food to go around. We're competing over who can buy the houses. And because we're competing over the houses, that's why the prices go up, yeah, because we are competing to get that house. Uh, the price goes up and only someone can buy that house. And some people don't even get nice housing at all because it's just too blooming expensive. And so there's so much competition in our world. This is what the world is like, always competing over things. And a world where there is competition yeah, is a world where there's also is a, a lot of negativity. There's a lot of uh, uh, violence often comes out of competitions. There are winners and losers. And of course, the losers are always going to feel badly hurt, whereas the winners are going to be arrogant and stupid, sometimes anyway, not always, sometimes. And so we're creating this world where actually where we tend to end up with violence. Yeah? And this is what you see in the world. A large part of the violence that we see in the world yeah, comes because we compete over limited resources. This is a kind of basic economic theory that there's only so many resources to go around. And so we are competing over limited resources. And this is why sometimes I think some of the wars that we have in the world, they are based on uh, basically this kind of wars that we have here. We want the oil in the Middle East, and so America sends troops into Iraq. Yeah, even though they just find some kind of silly excuse, they have some, you know, some bad weapons or whatever. They actually they didn't have those weapons at all. But you know, <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of you know whatever. I don't know really know why they went in there, but that is very likely to be one of the reasons. Yeah, we're always pursuing these resources together, so we fight within families. We fight within society. Yeah, we fight globally between nations. And if we could, we'd probably fight with Mars, yeah, because we want to fight kind of for more kind of hegemony in the solar system or whatever it is. Uh, we just keep on fighting because we are kind of uh, competing over these resources. Uh. And so the idea here is that the five sense realm uh, is inherently violent. Uh, it is inherently full of uh, um, full of uh, uh, you know when we, we kind of butt up against each other, uh, yeah and always competing over things. This is inherently part of the five sense realm. And that is kind of really awful. Yeah, it means that there is no final kind of way of governing our society. There is no final way of finding peace in our society because it is inherently problematic. And uh, to me, that is a very incredibly off-putting thing. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. You will never find a place where you can actually get away from these kind of things. There is no government that actually works in this way. There is no utopia where finally things get settled uh, and things get sorted out. Uh, there's always going to be competition, uh, always antagonism, always violence, uh, always problems down the track, uh, because that is the nature of that five sense world. Uh. And uh, the Buddha, in other places in the suttas, he analyzes this in more detail. If you have a look at the Mahanidana Sutta in the long discourses of the Buddha, uh, this is the... Um, a long discourse on causation, very beautiful sutta, it talks about this um, uh, sequence and how kind of violence always comes out of the five sense world uh, and how it is actually unavoidable there. And to me, that is incredibly kind of awful. Uh, and, uh, you know, you look at actually one of the suttas as well, which I have uh, taught here in the past, uh, it's called the uh, Atadanda Sutta, and Atadanda means something like the taking up of uh, weapons, the taking up of punishment. Uh, and this is the idea that uh, in the world we all kind of confined to this small little space. Yeah, the planet we, we are on is kind of fairly small. Yeah, and if you travel around the world and you go to a different society, is it any different? No, it's the same. It doesn't matter where you go, everywhere you go, it is kind of dangerous. Everywhere you go, it's the same kind of fighting going on. Uh, Humanity is basically the same everywhere. There is no escape from this realm of competition, this realm we're always butting up against each other. We are all together in this little puddle. And while we're in this puddle, we're trying to thrash about, trying to find a way out. Actually, there is no escape from this kind of thing. And the Buddha-to-be, he says that when he saw this in his own life, he got fearful, yeah? Because the human realm is through and through fraught with this kind of competition and violence and all of these kind of things. And so the five sense world is kind of inherently problematic. 
And that with the five sense world always comes violence, always comes wars. That's why we're seeing wars around the world again. Yeah, it's kind of very fascinating. I, after the Second World War in Europe, Europe, Europe was one of the places where the Second World War was the worst. Uh, yeah, tens of millions of people being slaughtered during the Second World War. It was really, really terrible. Whole cities raised to the ground, especially in the middle of Europe. You know, I, my family was in Norway. Norway is kind of a bit on the side. Yeah, so not many people died there. But in the middle of Europe, kind of, it was just terrible. It was like a slaughter going on there. And then after the Second World War, everyone says, okay, never again. But of course, that's not true, right? Never again. People don't work like that. People say never again for a while. Then amnesia starts to happen. Yeah, you forget everything that actually was going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't remember anything anymore. The older generation passes away. The new generation doesn't get that information, right? And so then war starts all over again. We never learn. We never learn. I think that's really a very important point about humanity. We never really learn. And the reason we don't learn is because the underlying cravings, the underlying defilements are always there. Underlying tendencies, anusias, we were talking about the other day here, yeah? waiting for an opportunity to re-arise. And when the opportunity is there, everything comes back again, the same problems as before. Yeah? Kind of, I, I apologize for being so negative. This must, <laughs> must sound really awful when I kind of sit here, but this is kind of what the world is like a little bit, right? Uh, it is uh, problematic in this particular way. Yeah? And um, so... Um, uh, there's this saying that uh, kind of sounds like a very fancy saying. Uh, those who don't uh, remember the history are bound to repeat it. Uh, there's a saying by his, there was a philosopher, I think, who said that uh, uh, some time ago. And, um, and, and it's kind of a nice saying, yeah? If you don't remember your history, you, you're bound to repeat it. Uh, and you can see that happening. Uh, but the problem is that we cannot remember our history here. Uh, even if we try, we will never remember it because we are bound to forget that, that is just the nature of what we are as human beings. And so even though that saying is interesting, it doesn't really help us. We will still forget it regardless. That's the problem. And so this is the idea of the piece of meat. So what do we do then? What is the alternative? We always have to set out the alternative, otherwise it kind of gets too depressing. And the alternative is then to look for instead of looking for that uh, peace, looking for happiness in that world of the five senses, uh, instead of grabbing the piece of meat, uh, which we are going to compete over, uh, instead you do something where there is no competition. Uh, and the place where there is no competition uh, is inside of yourself, is building up your own private qualities. Uh, yeah, There is no competition there. No one is going to come and say, I'm going to grab those good qualities inside of you. Yeah, That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, So that is kind of your private sphere. And because there is no competition, you avoid the violence. In fact, you do the exact opposite. Because by building up good qualities inside of you, those qualities will ensure that you don't engage in violence in the future. Yeah, Because those qualities are the opposite of violence. So you can see how the spiritual path actually leads to the exact opposite. If you want to avoid all the bad consequences in the world, Building up good qualities within is actually the path to go. Then you can be a source of harmony in the world. You can be a source of people working together. Why? Because actually you understand the problem with the external world and you build up the inner qualities instead. And this is how this whole way of thinking takes you in a different direction. It takes you to a path of a life that actually becomes much more meaningful and much more useful for you and for everyone else. The simile of the piece of meat. Okay, let's let's do a little bit more meditation together here. Hey, everyone. So, any more uh, comments? Uh, do I want to say anything? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, my question is regarding this economy with diversity. Is there such a thing? Can economy, economy, I assume, upeka, 
yeah. be accomplished when there is diversity, where the, all the senses are, are can, engaged. Yeah, so. it can be accomplished to some extent. Yeah, yeah. because you, uh, I, it is hard to kind of keep it going because uh, if you come, let's say you come out of a deep state of meditation and all the desires, the five senses are gone, then that equanimity is accomplishable. Yeah, because the desire is not there. You can have an even mind. Uh, but before you go to samadhi, it's much more difficult. Uh, the best thing you can do is basically to have a degree of sense restraint, uh, whereby you understand the danger in these things, and you kind of keep your mind in a balance in the middle there somewhere. That is what is meant by the idea of diversity, and it's actually the word upeka is used in a few places in the suttas in that particular way uh, uh, at that point. Uh, but uh, you're right, it is much more, of course, difficult, uh, and ideally samadhi is really the way to achieve it. Uh, because I assume that equanimity with unity yeah. would be ekagata. Yeah. From ekagata. Ekagata, yeah. So that would be like the, the jhana states, yeah. Uh, upeka from the jhana states, especially the third and the fourth jhana is where you find that kind of upeka. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Same question. Same question. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I, let me see what um, ek, one, two, based on unity means. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Fire away. Yeah, just the same thing on the diversity. What is the body word you get translated from? I think diversity is usually nanatta, usually, and uh, unity is usually ekata. Uh, so nana means many, uh, and nanatta then means uh, manyness or diversity. But I'll, I, I, let me look it up so I don't kind of tell you dodgy things. Uh, so um, I try not to be a dodgy monk, so we we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> So we have Sutta Central, our usual uh, watering hole when it comes to suttas. Uh, so we have the uh, basket of discourses over here, yeah. And then we have the middle length sayings over there, middle length sayings again. We have number 54, so we go down to the middle ones, uh, chapter on householders is where we go. 51, 52, 53, 54, for the householder, Bhante Subhiko Sujato, who will Assume that he is the, he is the right person here. Uh, so where are we? The danger of sensual pleasures. So here we are. Yeah. Um, so here you go. Yeah. So down here you have the nanatta upeka. I don't know if you can see it down here. I'll, I'll blow it up a little bit so you can see more of what's going on. Blowing up, blowing up, blowing up. Bang. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, yeah, upeka, nanatta. Uh, na, uh, nanatta, sita. Sita means based on diversity. Sita is like uh, founded on, yeah, or holding on, or grasping onto. Can you see it over there? Upeka, nanatta, yeah? This, this particular thing over here. Uh, nanatta, and then you have the um, upeka, which is ekata. That's the upeka based on oneness. Ekata literally means oneness. And uh, it is often used in the context of samadhi. Uh, samadhi is the oneness of the mind, the yeah, non-diversity of the mind, the uh, ekatta upeka. And uh, it is uh, the opposite of duality. So very often we talk about the uh, Brahmanical teachings, we talk about Advaita Vedanta yeah, as one of the kind of the heights of meditation within the Brahmanical and within the Hindu system. Uh, and uh, this is the Buddhist uh, equivalent of uh, Advaita Vedanta. Ekatta means the same thing. Uh, Oneness and non-duality is basically the same kind of word. Uh, and so this is what this means, the non-dual upeka, uh, upeka without duality. So uh, that's kind of nice, I reckon. Anyway, I reckon that's nice. I don't know what you reckon, but that's my, my reckoning. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, let's go back again. Okay, so please... Uh, Fire away, everyone. I shouldn't use these kind of violent metaphors, but that's what I use. And, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. Hi, Ajahn. Hi. Um, I, I never know that there are so many types of upeka. Mm. I wonder whether the upekas, these two upekas here in uh, discussed in this Uttaliya uh, Sutta, mm. similar to the upekas uh, in Brahma Vihara 1 or in the uh, the number 8 uh, 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 path, the Sama 
or bika. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, the different kinds of bika, are they all the same or not? They're not exactly the same. And uh, the meaning of bika, the basic meaning, is to look on. That's the basic meaning, yeah? So it comes from the verb which means, uh, because the word akka, akka is like, akki is an eye, you're seeing. Yeah? And so it has to do with looking. Yeah? And upa, the prefix upa means like looking on or something like that. Uh, so you're looking on something, and the idea is that uh, to look on, you cannot be biased. If you are biased, you're no longer looking, you are being driven by desires. You're not, you, so the idea is to observe, right? And if you're going to observe properly, you can't be biased. And so the idea here with Pekka is they have a non-biased mind. Yeah, that's what equanimity means. That's why the lower kind of equanimity is when you have sense restraint. The mind is not drawn toward certain object, nor does it reject certain object. But it stands in the middle just observing what is going on there. So looking on, yeah, that's the idea of Upeka. And But it's quite difficult to do when you are in the middle of the five sense realm because it's very easy to get drawn into attachments and, and desires and this kind of thing. And that's why the higher kind of Upeka is after you abandon all the five hindrances, you enter a state of jhana, the five hindrances are completely abolished for a long period of time, then when you come out of that jhana, then your mind really is equanimous, and you can really look on. And that is why it is such a powerful foundation for insight, yeah? because insight requires observing, unbiased observing, that's almost the definition of insight, unbiased observing. And that unbiased observing can only happen when the five hindrances, the defilements of the mind, the biases of the mind, are completely overcome. So uh, that is kind of the upeka of the, of the jhana states. And the upeka of the jhanas is very similar to the upeka of uh, the Brahma Viharas. Yeah, Brahma Viharas, the highest kind of Brahma Vihara, is basically the same as the fourth jhana upeka, I would say. Yeah. Then you have the uh, upeka of the bojangas, the factors, that's probably maybe what you were referring to, the seven factors of awakening. Yeah. That is also similar because the bojangas are sequential. So you start with the sati, yeah, mindfulness. Then you have the Dhammavicca, the contemplation or the investigation of phenomena. Then you have the energy. Then you have the piti, the rapture. Um, then you have the pasadi, the tranquility. Then you have the samadhi. And then you have the upeka. So the upeka comes after samadhi. And so what that means is that... Um, uh, wow, what happened? Okay, anyway, uh, what happened is that... Um, Because it comes after samadhi, that upeka also then relates to the very high upeka of the jhana, the fourth jhana in particular. Yeah. So uh, it is basically these two kinds of upeka. Before jhana, where it's weak, it's just based on sense restraint, and after jhana or after Brahma Vihara, where it is kind of settled and strong. That's why it is powerful for insight practice. Uh, yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? Uh, anyone, any other comments? Uh, yeah. Hello, Hajjan. Yeah, hi. Um, actually, uh, the point zero doesn't mean the degree of uh, the opposite factors are zero, right? Upika equanimity means yeah. they are balanced. So there is something there. For example, like uh, yeah. uh, in the sutta, it was mentioned about yolk. Yeah. Six animals that are tied together yeah. with a knot. So it depends on which animal is the strongest and one will be pulled in that direction. Yeah. So equanimity doesn't mean there is no animal. There are animals. It's just that they are in a balanced condition. There are, the animals are in a balanced condition. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think it's more to do with uh, how you react to the animals. Uh, yeah? So the animals pull in a certain direction, but it is what, what happens to that animal when it pulls? Uh, what happens to your mind? Uh, there will still be certain faculty which dominates, yeah? The, the sight faculty will often dominate because seeing is a very strong, powerful sense for animals and human beings. So, so there will still be a sense that dominates, but uh, I can't remember exactly how that simply works now, whether uh, 
Uh, because even if you have no desires, those five senses will still be there. Yeah, you come out of a jhana state, there will still be five senses. Uh, but your reaction to them will be equanimous. Uh, you will not react with desire, but you will still have the five senses. Uh, and there will still be some sense that predominates in a certain way. But the predomination will not happen through desire. It will happen through other means, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, a, in a different kind of way. Uh. So it is not, I don't think it's exactly the same. Uh, the, uh, it's not so much that they are in balance, it's just more that you don't react to what is happening with, uh, with kind of bad, quote, bad things. Uh, does that make sense? Are you sure? Uh, yeah? Yeah? Okay. Reasonable? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> we'll maybe think about it and see what happens. Uh, so, uh, all right. Shall we? Anything else? Yeah? Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Ajahn, for your wonderful teachings. Um, just wondering uh, what happened to the dog uh, <laughs> in the sense, all of us, there's so many beings here, and yeah. it's just very small population which are actually human beings. Mm. And out of that, also very few people who actually have access to Dhamma. So I have always been wondering, there's so many beings in so many realms, yeah. lower than the human realms, mm. uh, who possibly uh, go around the world uh, for eons together, mm. till maybe one of the parami ripens and they have, um, you know, the good fortune to listen to dhamma and mm. you know progress further. So if that doesn't happen, mm. uh, you know, because our conditioning is so powerful, as you say, you mm. know, and we keep on reaping bad karmas once we are in one particular realm. Mm. Is there any way out for these beings, or they keep on going around for <laughs> eons because? It, Buddhists yeah, are just one yeah. percent when I see, and there's so much, so many people around, yeah. so many beings around, hell realms, beta realms, so on and so forth. Mm. Do they ever come out of this? Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. These, are, these are the simple questions to answer. These are kind of the easy ones. <laughs> no, I'm being naughty. So uh, it's interesting. There is a sutta where the Buddha is asked pretty much that question. He's asked by someone. Someone comes over and says, "Ah." Oh, do all beings eventually become fully enlightened or only half of all beings, or only a third? And what did the Buddha say? You know that sutta? <laughs> what did the Buddha say? What do you think he said? Will all beings become enlightened? Only half of all beings, only a quarter, maybe 10%, maybe 1%. What happened to the rest of the beings who don't become enlightened? What did the Buddha say to that question? Oh, we are all doomed. We're all doomed. <laughs> no. no, this is not kind of the Buddha doesn't say that sort of thing, right? The Buddha doesn't say we're all doomed. It's not kind of how the Buddha speaks. The Buddha didn't answer that question. Isn't that kind of fascinating? He didn't give an answer. He remained silent. That's kind of interesting in his own right. Why do you become silent? Probably because, silent because maybe there is no answer to that question. And uh, so, uh, and, and how can they, I mean, one of the strange things about the Dhamma, when you think about it, we know that there are regular Buddhas arising. Yeah? At the regular intervals, there is a Buddha arising. Yeah? And if you think about time, and if you think about there is no first point, uh, there is no origin, origin of samsara, then presumably there has been an infinite number of Buddhas, because there's no point. Yeah? But if there has been an infinite number of Buddhas, uh, how come everyone isn't enlightened already? Yeah? <laughs> It sounds like everyone should be enlightened if there was an infinite number of Buddhas, right? Because there cannot be an infinite... Presumably there's a limited number of beings. Uh, so if it goes back forever... Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, and it's kind of one of those kind of strange conundrums. And I sometimes I discuss this point with Ajahn Brahm. See what Ajahn Brahm has to say about these kind of things. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm sometimes... And so one of the possibilities is that maybe new beings arise out of nothing or something like that. Uh, yeah? New beings arise, a consciousness somehow develops in new ways. Maybe they're coming from plants. Maybe the rudimentary consciousness of plants somehow becomes a human being. Or something. Maybe more human beings arise. Uh, so there actually is no end point. Uh, there isn't, because more human beings arise, it, it just keeps on multiplying all the time. So there is no final end point. Uh. So I don't know what the answer is. Uh. It's kind of one of those conundrums, yeah? We don't know. But coming back to this idea of beings being trapped, which is kind of more practical what you were talking about, uh, that what happens to that dog, yeah? What happens to all these animals? What happens to all the mosquitoes? Uh, what happens to all the, uh, you know, ghosts? Uh, and uh, the answer is that it is very scary to be reborn in those places. Uh, once you are reborn there, it may take a very, very long time before you come out again. Uh, 
And this is kind of one of those things. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha gives these kind of teachings that gives an overview of samsara. Yeah, how many tears you have cried, how many bones you have built up into a mountain larger than the Mount Betpula, whatever it is. Uh, to give these symbolism, to give an idea of how difficult it is to get out. Uh, in the um, in the Balapandita Sutta, Majjhima 129, the fools and the wise people, uh, in that sutta he says that it's like the yoke thrown on the ocean. Uh, and the turtle coming up every hundred years. Uh, what is the chance of that turtle sticking its head through that yoke, uh, through that wheel? Uh, it's pretty small. Uh, and that is what happens if you are reborn in the animal realm or whatever. The chances of coming out again is very small. Uh, that will depend. On what kind of person you are. If you are a good person who just happens to be reborn in the in the, in the bad realm because you, uh, you know, you you did a few kind of some dodgy thing or whatever, then you come out of it very quickly again. But if you are a foolish person who who habitually does bad things, that is when you get stuck in this particular way. So samsara is, if the Buddha is right about what he says, it's problematic. Yeah, it's kind of scary. It's kind of, you know, we have, it mainly gives you a sense of urgency about the practice when you start to understand what is going on there. So what happens to that dog? Well, eventually one dog, the, the dog looks across the road and he sees the Buddhist temple. Yeah, it's always been there. It is so close by him. It is so nearby him. I just never saw it. And sometimes Buddhists are actually really blind. They don't really know what they're doing as Buddhists. Yeah, it's true. So the reality is often very complicated, much more complicated than I'm making out. So. Uh, and yet it is true. Sometimes people are literally in the vicinity of the Buddha. One of my favorite stories from the Sutta is actually from the same one, Majjhima Nikai 26. Ah, um, the gentleman in the green t-shirt. You're the one who complained the other day that I wasn't teaching the whole Sutta, right? Yeah, so that was the one. So this is another part of this particular Sutta, which is kind of great. And I love this little story here. And this is after the Buddha's awakening. I've told this story many times before here, but I will teach it again because it's kind of nice. Just after the Buddha's awakening, uh, he starts wandering, he starts wandering towards um, uh, Saranath, where he's going to teach his five disciples, right? Uh, and then as he's wandering towards Saranath, he kind of meets this fellow on the way called Upaka. Upaka, the Ajivaka disciple. This kind of belongs to a different religion. And Upaka is kind of, wow, what happened to you? <laughs> he doesn't say that, but he, he says, uh, you know, wow, your faculties are so serene. Yeah, who is your teacher? Uh, and then the Buddha says something like, yeah, my, you know, I don't have a teacher, I'm self-awakened Buddha, or whatever. And Upaka kind of doesn't get it. He thinks that he, this is just kind of this conceited person or whatever, because he hasn't got it. Everyone has a teacher, right? This is kind of ancient India. Everyone has a teacher. And so Upaka kind of dismisses him and says, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And he walks off in the wrong direction. There you are in the presence of the Buddha. This is even more than being in the presence of the BGF, right? You're in the presence of the Buddha himself. You don't get it. You walk off and the umanga, the umanga is the wrong path. And you walk away. This is kind of the problem. Yeah, It's actually very, very difficult. When I hear people say, yeah, you know, in the present day, we don't know whether the Dhamma is still here or whatever. I'm going to wait for the next Buddha. I tell them, you won't recognize the next Buddha. You will have no idea who it is, right? Use the Dhamma now. Now you have the opportunity. Don't be foolish. Don't think that you are wise enough to even know who the Buddha is when you see him next time. And so this is kind of the problem of the world. It is very, very sticky and very, very hard to get out of. And so all of these things are really, please don't allow them to make you depressed because you are all on the right track anyway. Yeah, you are here, you're doing the right thing, you're heading in the right direction, heading towards the light, out of darkness. So that's wonderful, but allow these things to give you a little bit more oomph in your practice. Everything you do matters. Everything you say is important. Every thought you have actually matters for your life. Treat it as yesterday. Were, were you all there yesterday when I gave a talk yesterday? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this idea, this simile of crossing the road, right? You are about to cross the road. Look left, look right. Far more important than crossing that road. It doesn't matter if you die while crossing the road. What matters is how you, what you do now. Much more important. Yeah? You're about to make a life-determining decision every time you open your mouth. That's why I shouldn't say bad things about the Christians. Right? <laughs> Comparing it to the Christians. <laughs> yeah. And so this is kind of how we get um, the sense of urgency arising. Yeah, we understand the importance of these things. So.
Okay. We're not doing anything bad, mm. you know, so we'll be born again as human beings. Continue as being a human being, mm. uh, be complacent, you will be eventually enlightened because everybody is going to get enlightened. So, yeah, so you know, after, why, why practice? You know? After an eon and hell, you after will be enlightened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe people say that, but it's not the wise people don't say that. So. <laughs>